afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to welcome today my good friend and colleague Susan Daniels back home. I say back home for three reasons. First, Susan grew up in New Orleans, and though she has lived in our nation's cantankerous capital for the last dozen years, the spicy joie de vivre that New Orleans is renowned for still permeates her personality. Second, Susan is the mother of rehab counseling here at LSU, having been, <coughs> having been recruited by then Dean Abadie and Mr. A.J. Dixon to be the first head of the department, which she started from square one in 1978. The third reason for saying I'm welcoming Susan back home is that among her diversity of talents and titles, what Susan really is, in her mind and heart, is a teacher. So she is certainly very at home talking with a group of eager learners as we have here today. Please join me in expressing our appreciation to Susan for coming today to teach us about the experience of living a full life after polio. Let's start off by just taking a historical note for a second. Um, last week, uh, the president went and um, dedicated a statue at the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in a wheelchair. Um, the other statues of him do not, do not depict in any obvious way that he was a wheelchair-using person. And, um, and the American people raised over $30 million to have a statue cast of him in a wheelchair, and it was dedicated. So you might remember this is a day um, or a time when that was really a, um, a very historical event because they put that entire, that entire uh, memorial up to a fabulous and great president without ever mentioning that he actually um, served as president of the United States from a wheelchair. Okay, so the first question is, is polio, what is polio? What actually is it? Well, it's a viral infection. That's what it is. Just like meningitis or the flu that you have that many of you get. Um, and here's, here's another piece of information. You've all had polio, every one of you, okay? Um, we've all had it. Um, and some people have effects of polio because it affects them in a certain way. But everybody's had polio. In the old days, and I do mean in the old days, now this is not the preferred method of rehabilitation. In the old days, it was, you know, what I call the gut grinding, shit kicking rehabilitation kind. It's get them up on their feet, exercise, 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 more exercise. And the idea here was to take any neurons that weren't damaged and get them to take over. <laughs> because there are millions of neurons going to every little tiny strand of muscle, right? And if some of them are killed, maybe others near it would take over. And so they're kind of reprogramming the idea was to reprogram. Um, and so it was really shit kicking rehab. I mean, that's, that's what it was. They put people in lifting weights, parallel bars, putting them in braces, and all kinds of really vigorous activity and uh, a no stop attitude. Okay. Now, this no stop attitude, the sister would call the, was called then the Sister Kenny approach, which was push, 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 um, produced a, a lot of what we affectionately call today polio heroes. Okay? FDR was a polio hero. In fact, he was like one of the major polio heroes. And what he did was, he did two things. He went as far as he could go with his physical rehab. Push, 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 push. And then he pretended like it didn't happen. Okay? In fact, he got an entire nation of 100 million people to pretend with him. Okay? He was a great master. They, they called it, what is it, Henry, what's the name of the book? The Splendid Deceit. Yes. Yeah, a splendid deceit. That is, he convinced everybody that he really was fine. <laughs> Where he couldn't walk a step. The man could bear, couldn't stand up without braces. And he couldn't walk at all. Um, but he was a big man, and everybody, his, his sons and then everybody kind of gathered around him and made it look like he could do things. So part of the, the natural course of, of the polio that you will see today in adults my, my, my age. You're guessing now, huh? <laughs> Just how old is she? You're wrong. I'm older than that. <laughs> I just look good for 82. Um, the, the, the natural history of it is to get better, but then to be pushed. So every, there are lots of polio heroes around, and you'll see them everywhere. And they're a pain in the butt to work with, let me say, because they're hard-headed. And they learn that. They weren't born that way. 
Well, they may have been born that way, but they also had every opportunity in the world to learn that behavior. Because the kind of rehabilitation done in those days with people with physical disabilities was to overcome it, overcome it, overcome it. Today, of course, the word is adapt to it, adapt to it. But then it was overcome it. That is, get to be just as close as you can to everybody else, like everybody else is. Just as close as you can get. And so if you walk with a limp, walk with a less of a limp then. Try to walk straighter. And if you, um, if you have to use a wheelchair, and God knows why you would have to use a wheelchair, you could use braces and crutches, unless your arms are weak too. But if you have to use a wheelchair, try to make, try to make it as little a wheelchair and use it as little as possible. Okay, so the whole idea here was to get to be as, quote, normal as you can get. Now, not a bad idea, really. I'm saying this now with a bit, with a bit of sarcasm in my voice, but it's not a bad idea if the world is totally inaccessible. If the only way you really can go to school is to learn how to get up steps or crawl up them. There's not going to be an elevator or a ramp where you're going. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, in New Orleans, there's still not a lot of curb cuts. Okay? Try to get accessible transportation in New Orleans. Unless you are filthy rich, you can't afford it. Okay? So it wasn't a bad idea in 1954 to make people go as far as they could go. In doing that, it's not a crazy thing that people were doing. They were recognizing that if you couldn't go up steps, or if you didn't find another way to get places other than a wheelchair, you probably weren't going very far. You weren't going to school, certainly. You weren't going to college, you weren't going to work, you weren't going down to the Palace Theater, you weren't going over to Tipitina's either. You weren't going anywhere. You were sitting your little behind home with your mama and becoming old with her. So there was some sense to what they were doing. But the sense, of course, was disproportionately a burden to the individual with a disability. There's another, another kind of set of issues related to polio that are similar in many other disabilities. And I'm going to call that, that factor heightened vulnerability. If there is something physically or mentally wrong with your body's functioning, and by the way, there is, whether or not you know it, nobody's perfect, you are vulnerable in unique ways to several kinds of threats. One of them is you're vulnerable because you are in the hands of many strangers, including healthcare professionals. Lots of people touch you, put things in you, deal with your limbs that would otherwise never come near you. Okay. You know, they say um, in a hospital is a terrible place for a sick person. Right? Putting a lot of people to, in close proximity to one another, pneumonia, um, hepatitis, you get all kinds of things in a hospital. So you're vulnerable to all kinds of um, diseases and, and bad breaks, bad luck, when you have a lot of that kind of stuff happening in your life. You're also extremely vulnerable to loss of function. It's another heightened vulnerability. You know, if I said to you, well, for the next week, you're going to have to function without your right arm. We're going to put it in a sling. You would have a hard time, but you'd adapt to it. Because you have other parts that are working pretty good, legs and back and head and the other arm. So pretty quickly, you can adapt to that. But the fewer things that actually work physically in your life, the more any encroachment makes it more and more difficult to adapt. So you're vulnerable to, ex to extreme losses over minor problems. Um, I think you noticed when I came in, I came in with a tall, beautiful young lady. Her name is Pam, and she, she's my personal assistant. And we had the, um, the great pleasure this last weekend of putting up a computer a workstation for a colleague and friend of ours who has a very <coughs> severe physical disability. And if you just put the, the board the keyboard one inch further 
from where she wanted it, she couldn't reach it. Period. Okay? So if somebody comes in your house and just kind of passes it, knocks it back, bingo, off the computer for a week until somebody can come and move it back in place. So you're extremely vulnerable to bad things, little bad things turning into big bad things. Now, the second kind of risk is that environmental ability risk. Um, uh, I'll give you just two examples of that. One is I love my scooter. I'm a big technology freak. Right, I love this piece of equipment. This is a beautiful piece of equipment. It's great. I have a great computer, and I use voice recognition software, and you know, I have all kinds of gadgets in my house, and I love that stuff. I'm a techno freak. I can't help it. But when this scooter doesn't go, guess what happens to my life? Down the toilet, fast. I have a relationship with my scooter. It's not just a piece of equipment to me. I don't like to admit that, but I am personally attached to an inanimate object. I don't think that sounds mentally healthy. <laughs> but I can actually get upset when the scooter isn't working right. I can get upset. And I've just recently had a little problem with it where it would just all of a sudden quit running. And that's okay. That's no big deal. You can get it started again, except if you're like right in the middle of a street. Or you got your front wheels on the metro on the train, and the back wheels aren't in yet, then it's a problem, okay? Well, my scooter doesn't work, I don't go to work. <coughs> and if I was in school, I wouldn't go to school either. I can't go where I'm going. So one little tiny wire is the difference between me functioning and what you would call normally, or maybe you wouldn't, or what I would call normally, and not functioning at all not showing up for class, not being at that meeting where my boss expects me, not signing those grant papers and getting them out of Washington. Just that one little wire is the, is the level of adaptation or vulnerability that I have. Now you, you're different. You see, your car doesn't start, you can borrow another car. You can catch the bus. You can call a friend and get in the ride. I can't get in anybody else's car, right? You can call a taxi. You can get there in about eight or nine different ways, wherever you need to go. I can get there one way. That one way don't go, I don't go. Okay. For people who have disabilities, when they look like they're right, pulling it off, they're pulling it off on the margin, right at the edge and could easily fall off, easily, and do frequently. So sometimes you hear, from, you hear about people who have disabilities who don't make it to work every day. You'd say, boy, they're really pulling the GIMP routine, right? How come I have to be at work every day and they don't have to be at work every day? Well, I would have said the same thing myself until I couldn't make it to work one day. Because you can make it to work or the class. You've got alternative routes. Disability is not so bad a way to live. In fact, it's a pretty interesting way to live. But it does, does pretty much keep you on one road for everything. There's only one kind of bra I can actually put on. I have to buy just those. Oh, God, help me if they stop making them. Right? They stopped making my very, very favorite thigh highs about 10 years ago. I wish I could buy out the, uh, the, the, storage fat, the storage room of these thigh highs. You know, I just get something that works, you know, a fabulous mascara, the way it opens and it's easy to handle, they stop making it. So I now buy things in dozens. <laughs> I buy a dozen everything. If I find something that works for me, I buy a dozen of them. Because I'm not going to be able to find them again. But that's the way it is. And with my, with my friend Benilda, her, her margin is about, a, about a two inches. Mine's a little bit bigger than that. Because I can actually stand up if I can't reach something and lean over to reach it. But she can't stand up. And so she can't reach anything that's not right in front of her. So just put it two inches away from her and that's it, it's over. Okay, she, can't, she can't get on. I can't go if my scooter doesn't go. I don't go without my scooter anymore. Yes, if I have enough time, 
like two or three days, I can rent another one, right? I can call somebody and rent one, and which is what I do if I get in a pickle. Yeah, but I can't make it to work that morning. I can make it to work the next morning. But that morning's already blown. And then I have all the problems of taking care of that problem. Yeah. So what I'm saying here is that people who have disabilities, significant disabilities, <coughs> physical or mental, either one, are always tottering right on the edge of being able to function because the things they have to do to function are so, so streamlined and so geared into one direction that if that doesn't work, it falls apart. And when it falls apart, different things happen. For me, I don't show. I get mad as hell, too. I get fighting mad when that happens. I could just kick this scooter when it doesn't work. I just want to scream. But for other people, people who have mental disabilities, they may end up in jail or homeless. One little thing went wrong, a check didn't come. Mm -hmm. <coughs> a sudden little thing happened and they're on the skids again. So the final principle being is you never get there. You're always going there. That living with a disability, just like every other aspect of life, is a constant readaptation and, some, and lots of times you don't make it. And you know, or you don't make it quickly, and you have to, and you have to struggle to get it back. I'm saying that because I want to go on to another another principle here that may help you as you learn about some other things. And I'm going to call those disability benefits. You're going to learn, if you, or maybe you've already learned, about all the kinds of quote disability benefits, like SSI. Raise your hands if you know what SSI is. Uh-huh, okay. Uh-huh, so supplemental security income. SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance. Workers' Comp. Long-term disability private insurance. Okay, all these things. Why, what are you insuring when you insure disability? Right? Why are some people more vulnerable to things not working than others? That's what you are insuring. When people get these benefits, it's mostly because it's not they can't do anything. It's just that they're so vulnerable to not being able to do it, or it costs them so much in effort to execute what other people do naturally that they can't do as much of it. And so we need to think about that when we think about people who look typical, look okay, look like everything's going peachy. They can sometimes hold it together for little bits of time. But can they continue that? And can they adapt when things don't go exactly right? People with very significant disabilities often have a hard time putting together the whole package that leads to a productive life. And the package is personal care, transportation, assistance, physical access. The package is huge. It has hundreds of pieces that most people don't even notice. And all the time to shop for just that one kind of bra you can actually close. No, you're not out there shopping for pretty earrings. You're spending time doing things other people are having fun and you're shopping for bras. And so that's the reason when things look on the outside like they work, they may not from the inside. And that if there are people struggling with that for long periods of time, they may not be able to do it forever. And so in this country, we let people retire on what's called disability. That is, we let them stop working if they don't feel like they can do, pull off this shenanigans any longer. I don't know if it's a good thing or not. We could discuss that indefinitely. But it is something I understand better now as I've gotten older. At first, I would not have understood it at all because it seems so drastic to exempt some people and not others from what's considered a typical life. But maybe, um, you know, maybe typical isn't all it's racked up to be. And certainly, 
our society has, has evolved to the point where the burden of adaptation is more borne by us all together as a society rather than for each individual to bear it so acutely themselves. And every time you see a ramp or you see braille or you see a sign language interpreter or you see someone being given some time to rest or recuperate from um, a mental trauma or a mental stress, all of those things that we all bear together as a society then makes, gives more of a margin for everybody else to live in. And that's the reason they're so important. Uh, I live in Washington, D.C. because I love it, because my husband lives there, because my job was there, but also because I can use public transportation there. I can go out anytime I want, pick up my little purse and my house keys, and leave and go where I want to without anybody having to go with me. And I love that. If I'm late, it's because I misjudged the time, not because I was waiting for somebody to come and get me, okay? That's worth a million to me. And in my daily life, I don't want to live in a place where I can't get around. Now, is the burden of getting around mine or the society's? I believe it's the society's. I think most people believe that to be the case too. In our country, almost all the research shows that other people believe that to be the case, and that's the reason our environment is changing so much. And that's the reason it's becoming so much more flexible. The edge, the margin, can be increased by the way society deals with things in general, how adaptive it is. But it can never deal with everything. Henry asked me to bring some of my show and tell. Um, Susan made, um, or Susan designed, things that make life easier. So I brought a few. Now, by the way, I do not, I do not approve of gimp wear. Gimp wear is all that stuff you find in the OT ordering books that take perfectly ordinary things and charge you twice as much for them. Okay? You know, like big grips. You know the big grip things? Come on. They used to charge people an arm and a leg for that stuff out of those GIMP catalogs, right? You can now go in linens and things and buy yourself any big grip thing you want, right? I love those big grip people. They just took, the, they, they took that right out from under them. I think it's great. What are these? Well, these, huh? Anybody seen these before? Anything like this? Look at it. Hmm? What is it? Anybody, come on. They're well, they're kind of tongs, yeah, they are. Actually, what they are, they are learner chopsticks. Uh huh. Bought these in um, a museum in Chicago. Pam, were you with me when we bought these? No? Bought these in a museum shop in Chicago. They are, uh, they were like two fifty, two dollars and fifty cents. Then I had a rehab engineer flatten out the end to make like a little paddle, okay? And I use this for all kinds of things for eating, especially things like Chinese food, where um, like egg rolls. You, you don't, I mean, I don't mind picking them up, but if they're hot, you mind, and you need something to pince with them, okay? Now, you know, if they got this out of one of those catalogs, and I have plenty of those, by the way, and I do order stuff from those catalogs. You know, this is twelve dollars. It's two fifty piece of plastic, and. People in China teach their children to eat with chopsticks, starting with these. These are learners. Okay, these are just beginning chopsticks. By the way, if you can't eat with chopsticks, you also should be in the market for some of these. <laughs> okay. I doubt there's anyone old enough uh, or arcane enough to know what these are. Hmm? I'll pass them around when I'm finished because maybe you in the back can't see what they are. Well, in the good old days, when life was gentler and more elegant, people had something called asparagus tongs. And when you served asparagus, you, ser you served them on a long plate with these kinds of tongs, so that one would simply pick up the tongs and pick up one or two asparagus and put them on their plate. Okay. Now, 
then I got these asparagus tongues, and I thought, this looks like, I mean, I've been looking for them. And I've been, I was willing to pay $100 for a pair of sterling silver asparagus tongs because I needed them really bad. So I've gone to all these, like, really fancy, like Neiman Marcus and in their wedding catalog places and stuff. Could not find a pair of asparagus tongs anywhere. I was in a store in um, Santa Monica about three or four months ago. And I saw these, and I bought three of them immediately bought as many as I thought I could handle. And then um, a rehab engineer friend of mine put a spring in it, okay? Now, this particular asparagus tongue I use for salad. It is much easier to grasp a bit of salad and get it to my mouth like this than it is to get it to balance on a fork and stay on a fork, especially those new kind of shishi salads where the, the winter greens and the spring greens, they're not crisp. So the fork doesn't really penetrate them. Okay. So since I was, I love those shishi little salads. I bought, I made myself some salad tongs. So I eat with these. Now, yes, they make things like this, um, adaptive equipment like this, but they look like adaptive equipment, right? I mean, I'm, I'm enough of a show in the scooter, and the wheelchair without needing to have funny-looking eating equipment. So I think this is. Odd looking, but it's not so odd. Okay. Like it's, it's thank you, thank you, Eddie. It's elegant. Um, and so I'm also making another one. I have another another set of this kind, the scissors tongs. You know the kind. Your mom may have some of these. The scissors tongs, where they're little tongs on the end, but they're scissors opening and closing them. Right? They cross over. Well, I have a set of those that I bought in Germany. Germans make fabulous things like this. They have real high quality um, wear that they make, you know, really good machine shop stuff. Well, I bought a set of those and I had a hinge put on them, a spring hinge. And I use those, I call that my Big Mac, okay? Because I use it for sandwiches because it has a big end on it and it's much easier. It's very hard to hold a sandwich together with one hand. And so I use, that's my Big Mac um, and I use that. Now, before I broke this, I had it on all the time and um, never saw. Now, I can tell you, I have known a million OTs and PTs and until three months, two months ago, I didn't have one of these. I'm going to put it on. A lot of people, when I first got to New Orleans right before Christmas, said to me, Oh, Susan, that's kind of weird. Double rings, you know, like, are you going to pierce your nose next? <laughs> um, you know, because it's kind of not, not me. I mean, I'm not real traditional, but I'm not that on the edge, right? So I had this double ring on. And, um, and this is a wonderful designed um, orthotic, and it keeps this joint from hyperextending, going back like that. It's just two little rings, perfectly simple. And then, after I got used to it in plastic, then a jeweler, a, a silversmith, made me a silver one. So it looks like jewelry, instead of looking like a little plastic thumb orthosis, right? I think that's fun. So that's it. Um, I'll take any. I'll I'll try to answer any question you think you can pose to me. Let's play stump the chump. <laughs> I think the question of social class is an interesting one. I think in our society, the word social class means the same thing as money. Um, because I think, um, this is not true in Europe, but I think in our country, the more money you have, the higher your social class is. Um, and um, I think money makes a big difference. I'm one of those people who does believe that the most unifying characteristic of disability in addition to in increased risk and vulnerability, is um, the, the high risk of poverty and being without resources. Um, so poverty as a side effect of disability or as a cause of disability is, I think, uh, really important. But I think, I do believe that folks who are wealthy or very well off with disabilities are a lot better off and have a lot higher status than those who do not.
in my mind, it's, it has a lot to do with money and access to resources. Whether or not you survive a disease has everything to do with how much money you have. And it's not that I had money for this treatment, by the way, for hepatitis C, or for my knee surgery. For one, I had insurance, and the other, I happened to live in Washington, where I could go to the National Institutes of Health. So I got my treatment for free, but I participated in a, in a long-term study. Okay, that's luck. Um, but that luck is based in a lot on, on having access to resources. And I think our system is just, it's broken. Nobody can say that in a country as rich, as powerful, and as at the top of the economic ladder of any other country ever in the existence of economies, the best time in the best place that we have 34 million Americans who don't have health insurance. This is not rehab counseling. This is politics. It stinks. It's an abomination in this country. And I don't, I don't know how we have allowed it to happen, but there are people who live their lives in terms of, life, of health insurance. What they do, where they live, what job they'll take, it's all based on whether or not they have access or can keep or get access to health care. And I think, it's, I think it's criminal. We don't want to invest in ourselves to the level where we would all have a decent life in the communal sense. We're, we're right now in a very bad period in our own social development as a country where it's everybody for themselves. And we're going to find out just how, how good that feels as we all get older and figure that one out. Because everybody for yourself, you know, it only works if everything's going right. And when everything, that's the only time it works. And that's not going to happen all the time in everybody's life. So I think we're in for a big, a big aw awakening. But I think we're in big trouble. Because the more inequities we have in our society, the more haves and have-nots we have, the weaker we are as a society, and the weaker we are as a democracy. And I think it's one of the major threats. That and the, and the ac access to education slash economic future. I mean, we have far too many people in our society who are not getting a good education and have no future in terms of work. None. And these people will not say stable, happy, and healthy as parts of our communities forever. They are going to be a problem. And whose problem is it going to be? All of us. There's no such thing as an isolated problem when it comes to this stuff. It's all our problem. If you can't walk safely down the streets of New Orleans today, it's your problem. That's how much of a problem it is. And I think that that's the same thing about health care and, uh, and about education. It's, it's, we just think it's somebody else's problem, but we don't recognize how much it impinges on our own lifestyle and our own health. Um, I think it's terrible. But, you know, I'm a liberal Democrat. What can I say? <laughs> and I'm proud of it, too. It may not be fashionable this week, but I'm proud of it. I think it would be Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, I was going to say, if I could spend a weekend on a big porch in front of an ocean with somebody sitting next to me telling me about their life and what they learned and how they thought about things, I think it would be Eleanor Roosevelt. I, I don't know. I think I'm too old to have heroes because I see, I see all of our clay feet. Um, but in terms of a person I just, whose life, it, was so much better and so rich, so much richer than it had any right to be, who made something out of a failed marriage, a crippled husband, uh, an ugly face, um, a brilliant mind. This woman put together, not only for herself, but for the rest of the world, great accomplishments um, out, of, out of weaving together disasters <coughs> and um, had more courage in her time as a woman and as a social change agent than I think anybody I could think of. So I think it would be Eleanor Roosevelt. Anyway, she wore ugly shoes, and any woman who wears ugly shoes is my hero. Um, I love ugly shoes. Um, but 
you know, given, given that she really was an ugly duckling, now she was rich, okay, we'll give her that. She started out rich. But she was ugly. She married a man she was desperately in love with, and he cheated on her, des shamelessly. Then he got polio, and she nursed him back to health and helped him run the country for, you know, God knows, during the worst part, the Depression and World War II. And then all the work she did, not only for labor unions, but for poor people, for racial justice, for, um, for the world, world peace. I just, she had every reason to be bitter and disappointed, and she just rose above it all. So I just think she's, a, she's, she's my kind of hero. Mm -hmm. Who's yours, Henry? <laughs> Good, huh? Ooh. Ah. My hero. <laughs> You're my hero. Uh. <laughs>